Hello and welcome to today's populism seminar. Uh, today's panel is on militant democracy and populism. As you know, the populism seminar is an initiative by Andrei Sasloff and Moritz Meyer from Radboud University Nijmegen, Robert Huber from University of Salzburg and myself, Annika Werner from the Australian National University. As mentioned, Today's session has uh, two research presentations um, by uh, Tom Toynes from the University of Leiden and Gizem Kaftan from Boston University. Our format today is a little bit different than normal um, in that Tom will give his presentation and then we'll have about a 20 minute discussion uh, on his work. Then unfortunately Tom will have to leave us and Gizims will take over and um, give her presentation and then we'll discuss um, her arguments. And as always, before we start, uh, very briefly, the uh, rules of uh, the house. Our house rules is, are, of course, that this webinar, as per usual, is are recorded. So everything um, that goes over the microphone or through the, uh, the camera is uh, will be recorded and we will post the video on our YouTube channel that you can access through our web page. And of course, if you want to ask any questions or have comments, you're more than welcome to either type them into the Q&A uh, of this uh, Zoom webinar, then uh, Andre or I will read it out. Or you can, of course, raise your hand uh, or with the respective item, uh, icon and we will give you permission to open your microphone and you can just ask your question. And that's already it uh, for me to say it and to welcome you and I'll hand over right away to uh, Tom and your presentation. Thank you very much, Annika, and thank you, uh, Andrea, you as well, and, and Maurits uh, and, and Robert for the organization of the Populism Seminar. Um, I'm going to try and keep things really uh, brief so that we have some time for discussion. And my apologies again for, for not being able to stay for the full presentation of Gizem as well. I was very much looking forward to it. Um, I am presenting uh, a paper uh, which is currently under review um, against EU militant democracy. And uh, I started thinking about this topic uh, about militant democracy as a kind of uh, solution uh, or approach to dealing with democratic backsliding in the European Union um, some time ago in a, in a different article. Um, and in this paper, I, I really try to do two different things. Firstly, I, um, I tackle what's essentially a legal question um, or a legal theoretical question, and that is uh, whether the European Union is a militant democracy descriptively. Um, and then secondly, I ask the question of whether it should be a militant democracy. Now, of course, these two questions come apart, right? So it could be a militant democracy, but maybe it shouldn't, or it could not be, and maybe it should, and so forth. Um, my own analysis in this article, to give you the conclusion straight away, is that it is a militant democracy in a couple of rather limited ways, uh, and that it should not be, that the European Union should refrain from militant democratic activity to protect democracy in Europe. Now, when um, starting this sort of exercise, we need to be obviously very clear about what we mean by militant democracy. And, and one of the things that I noticed in the literature, both in the legal literature and in the political science and political theory literature um, on this question, was that the definition of militant democracy was somewhat open-ended and was used in various different ways. Now, when you are in such a situation, militant democracy is, is of course a concept, it's not something that exists in the world, so we can't have a more or less accurate, empirically accurate, uh, conceptual uh, term. So we need to think about, okay, what's, what's this term doing and how can we uh, ensure that we're using a term like this uh, in a manner that's most appropriate. And essentially in this article, I try to um, formulate a definition of militant democracy along this kind of appropriateness condition uh, with several with several things in mind. Firstly, does it gel with the uh, canonical, traditional, um, theoretical explorations of the idea of militant democracy? Uh, second, uh, does it provide a heuristically useful and different uh, perspective on certain normative problems than other other concepts that might be close to militant democracy. Uh, 
And with those two criteria in mind, I define a position, uh, a concept of militant democracy, which focuses on what's sometimes called the militant democratic paradox. Now, the militant democratic paradox, as I'm sure you all know, is that um, a democratic actor in defense of democracy uses tools that themselves undermine democratic values. Right? When that happens, when the actor in response to a threat to the democratic order uses tools that are themselves anti-democratic, then that actor can be said to be acting in a militant democratic fashion. Now, like I said, not everyone agrees with that term, not everyone uses that term in that way, but I think that does meet the, um, meet the standards of being how original theorists first using the term, um, especially Lowenstein, how they use the term. It also gels with some kind of important recent contributions to this, uh, to this literature. I'm thinking of, uh, of Alex Kirchner's book, I'm thinking of Bastian Reibkeman, my colleague in Leiden, his book on militant democracy. They use, they use this term in the same way. Uh, it also heuristically offers something different and new in terms of how to approach this normative problem. Right? The problem being, uh, when you're thinking about militant democracy, it's normatively a very specific and interesting question to ask whether an actor can act anti-democratically to protect democracy. So I'm not talking about the more general sense of merely acting proactively to defend democracy. It really has to undermine democratic values. So with that definition in mind, I then go and look at whether I think the European Union uh, meets, this, um, meets this criteria. And I go through in the article four different mechanisms that the European Union has in its current uh, legal framework to respond to uh, member states that are backsliding on democracy. And these four uh, were chosen as, as they are all examples of, um, of mechanisms that have been described as militant democratic. They also seem to, seem to raise these sorts of issues um, most uh, straightforwardly. So the first is the possibility of using what has been called systemic infringement actions against backsliding member states. This is under Articles 258 to 260 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And here, um, ordinarily, these articles set up uh, procedures whereby either member states or the Commission uh, bring an action against a member state for violating a, a specific obligation. Uh, it's, it's usually on a, on a very specific level, and um, some academics have, have proposed that this can also be presented uh, for systemic uh, violations of uh, fundamental European values like democracy, the rule of law, equality, and so forth. The second mechanism that I look at is the rule of law conditionality regulation, which is the new regulation from 2020, uh, allowing the commission to propose suspensions or reductions in EU funding to a backsliding member state. So this is um, uh, 2020 slash 2092 is the regulation number. Uh, the third that I look at is the procedure. This is a, a not very well-known procedure. It's also never been used, but it's a procedure for deregistering European political parties and foundations for violating EU fundamental values. This is regulation uh, 1141 uh, from 2014. And the fourth, the final mechanism that I analyze is the possibility under Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union to disenfranchise a backsliding member state in the Council. Now, I know the formulation of Article 7, uh, the sanction is, is slightly wider than that. This opens the possibilities that are slightly wider, but I want to focus on its, um, on its kind of conservative uh, reading, how it's also mostly taken. Now, with those four mechanisms in mind, I've gone through and kind of systematically looked at whether these uh, criteria for militant democracy are met. And uh, I have to give you a very, uh, a very brief precis of, of, the, of the argument, but basically I argue that both the um, third and the fourth of the mechanisms I described, the procedure for deregistering political parties, and the possibility of disenfranchising a member state in the council, that they really do, um, in some sense, provide a challenge to uh, standard democratic norms of equal participation and so forth. Right. So these can really be described as militant democratic, um, militant democratic procedures. Whereas the first two, I argue, uh, don't meet that condition. So while they can be used to protect democracy, they don't really raise fundamental uh, values. Uh, of democratic theory, they rather act in, in, a, in a much more um, in a 
in a manner much more similar to what we know from criminal law, which is just that there's a sanction um, in response to a behavior. The behavior is uh, a behavior which is um, illicit for all parties involved, and the sanction is the same in, a, in every case, right? That's, that's a, a more criminal law logic happening in the first and the second mechanisms. Okay, so then I ask the normative question. I move from the kind of legal descriptive analysis to the normative analysis, and I ask, well, should the European Union act in this militant democratic fashion? And there, uh, rather than kind of reopening the whole box of militant democratic theory, I, I try to isolate certain standards in militant democratic theory, which are um, shared by some of the more, um, to me, more convincing and some of the more prominent uh, examples of militant democratic theory. And I isolate two particular standards uh, in, that, in that theoretical literature, which I think are the most convincing. So I, I don't make any claims as to the defensibility of militant democracy in general. I just say, well, if we're going to be militant democratic, then these seem to be two criteria which are minimal criteria for justifying undermining one's own values to protect democracy. First, I say there needs to be an existential threat, right? The, the threat posed to democracy must be existential. So the co continued existence of the democratic order must be, um, must be in play. And secondly, militant democratic uh, responses must be necessary uh, to contain that threat. Because if as a democratic actor, you can act in a, uh, in, in a manner that does not violate democratic values to protect democracy against an existential threat, then obviously that should be preferred, right? Not to have to violate one's own values. With these two criteria in mind, I ask the question, well, should the European Union um, act in a militant democratic fashion? And I say, okay, well, it's certainly possible that some backsliding states pose an existential threat to European democracy, right? If we consider, for example, Hungary, um, we, we saw the, the news last night and this morning that Viktor Orban was re-elected uh, with a supermajority in the Hungarian National Assembly. Well, if Hungary is indeed a, a non-democratic state, as many as many think, as I believe, then uh, his continued participation in EU legislation and EU policy is very problematic, not only for Hungarian citizens that he claims to represent, um, but also for other European Union states and citizens. Right. So that this existential threat condition, we can at least imagine that it could be in play. Whether or not we have decided that it is currently in play in a specific case is a separate question. But theoretically, it's possible. So then I ask the last question, is this a necessary response? And there I make an argument, which is rather controversial, an argument that um, disassociation with an autocratic member state is always a possibility. And second, disassociation with an autocratic state would not violate democratic values. Right. These are the two. These are the two claims. So, firstly, uh, in fact, my argument is that even though there doesn't in the European Union treaties there is no expulsion mechanism, there is a manner to uh, de jure separate an autocratic member from uh, from other member states. I've, I've written on this a little bit uh, in the past, and the idea is basically that firstly you can use the sort of um, multi-speed Europe type uh, possibilities for further integrating certain member states and excluding others from integration. But more radically, um, if, if a member state was frankly autocratic, one could also just um, dissolve the European Union with all of the pro-democratic states withdrawing from the European Union via Article 51, and then using their qualified majority in the council to negotiate a transfer of resources, institutions, and so forth from the old European Union to a new one, basically replicating the institutional structure, the legal structure of the EU, and transferring its resources to a new organization, um, an EU 2.0. So this seems obviously very fantastical. But the idea is that if push comes to shove and a member state becomes frankly autocratic, rather than violating one's own democratic values, by isolating them in anti-democratic ways, right, by banning parties, by stripping member states of, of their right to vote, but continuing to hold them subject to European Union law and, and policy, it would be preferable at that extreme point to dissociate with that member state. Now, the idea is obviously not that this should be should happen immediately or that this is uh, this is a great great idea, but rather that being clear about where the limits are might help to contain also. Uh, backsliding states and bring them back towards the democratic fold. Okay, I, um, I'm going to 
stop there so that we have some time for discussion as well. Thank you. Um, how should we proceed, Annika? Um, um, so we have 10 minutes for discussion or something. Shall we do it that way? Um, yeah, exactly. I would say um, let's so we'll, invite comments. So you can you can either ask questions in the chat or you could also um, um, do it audially um, if you would prefer. Um, I don't see any questions as of yet. Um, I can ask a question if no until people have sort of um, thought about their um, their questions. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Um, so so obviously interesting and and timely. Um, so I was I was wondering. So you so you treat this as as a very sort of um, um, sort of theoretical um, abstract issue. Um, and I mean, I guess it's, um, I was wondering if it's, um, I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, you're talking about militant democracy and I guess maybe I'm thinking about it more in, the, in, 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 in terms of, um, of, of, um, of one of the options that you propose not to choose is sort of banning political parties, but I guess it's all kind of is tied in because I, I have a PhD and she was working on this for a while. So I was thinking about this. And I was thinking about her argument, which was, um, which was that 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 militant democracy or these 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 mechanisms that are that are used in order to to um, to clamp down when when there's anti-democratic forces are are highly contextual, and and that it that it depends on the period when you're talking about, it. and that that you can't really make an, an abstract argument in the sense of of, of empirically anyway. Um, I guess you can make a theoretical argument, but empirically when you actually try to um, look at in what context um, certain um, um, movements or parties get banned. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of switching it a little bit. Um, it's very contextual. So in the post-German era, it was the Communist Party. Um, in Spain, it's it's the Basques. <laughs> um, and, and and then I guess you know we might think about the more extremist forces that, that you know that. So I I don't know how how would you how would you respond to that? I mean in 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 in, in some sense, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess as a political theorist, I would want initially to start with some caution as to how we um, how we interpret the the term militant democracy in action, so in in the kind of real world, right? So we can certainly see um, cases of party bans as as a core example of militant democratic activity. It was also the first kind of major example. We see um, huge. Uh, huge activity in terms of party bans in, in Germany and in, in Turkey and, and elsewhere, right? Now, certainly in some cases, party bans are used in a good faith attempt by pro-democratic actors to stymie an anti-democratic uh, force. But it's also true that in some cases, party bans are used in ways that do not meet that criteria, right? That, that are not good faith attempts uh, to stymie anti-democratic activities in defense of democracy. Um, so we need, to, we need to be able to separate those two uh, from one another. And the only way that we can do that is, is through reflecting normatively on what it means to protect democracy, um, to be a pro-democratic actor and to be an anti-democratic actor. Um, otherwise, we're we would risk treating all party bans as kind of like uh, like for like, whereas, of course, um, an electoral autocracy could also um, have a system of party bans whereby the opposition is, is um, harmed in an anti-democratic way. Right? We wouldn't want to treat that with the same, with the same lens that we do uh, militant democratic activity, especially when we're doing a normative analysis of this activity. So certainly we need to be careful in every case. Um, that's also why I suppose I want to speak in this article to militant democratic theorists who present reasoned and moderate versions of militant democratic theory, uh, presenting a normative justification of limited, uh, my colleague Bastien Reibkema says self-correcting, right? Um, Alex Kirchner uses a different word, self-limiting, uh, different theories of, of militant democracy and say, okay, well, well could, they, could these justifications work? in the context of the European Union. And if they don't work, then we need to revisit these mechanisms. Right. How would, but so if then I, so then how would you take your, your argument then from, from, from the level of the EU, 
to 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 uh, the level of a nation state. So I'm thinking. So okay, so I I, I kind of get the argument. So I guess you, you theoretically, I mean, the EU should ban <laughs> or should 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 expulse Hungary in some sense. I mean, if they were to stick to some kind of um, I mean democratic principles. But how does a a country then um, a country then deal with this? It, I guess um, anti democratic forces within the country in some sense. Yeah, I mean that's that's an excellent question. And and to do that, you really would need to ask the question. Um, at the first level of the analysis, right? Are we convinced by militant democratic uh, theory as it has been formulated at the country level? Uh, it's a debate that I find extremely interesting, but it's not the, the one that I have contributed to. Uh, my, my idea here was to, to test something else, which is the question of, so militant dem democratic theory comes from the level of the nation state, right? Uh, the vast majority of, of militant democratic theorizing has been about nation state militant and democracy. And here the idea was, okay, well, that now, there are now some new theoretical contributions. I'm thinking Jan Vela Muller and, and some others. Um, there are also many more just instances where people use the term in the context of a supranational um, institution, especially in the European Union. Does that work, right? Does that, does that translation work? And my worry is that the normative justification at the nation state level, even for these kind of moderate conservative um, versions of militant democratic theory that it doesn't really work for supranational institutions. And the core difference is twofold. Whereas expulsion and banishment at the, at the national level are generally considered in political theory to be beyond the pale, even for the most extreme violations of, of, of criminal law. Um, kind of the Arendtian idea that we, everyone has a right to have rights, kind of no matter what. Uh, that that's just not true for associations which are um, in essence, voluntary. Okay, cool. Thanks for your answer. Um, so Mauritz has a question, um, and I'll, I'll just read it. I know that Mauritz has a small baby, so that's probably why he's not doing it in person, and he's, he's put it in print. So let me read it. So he says, thanks for the very interesting presentation, Tom, exclamation mark. I wonder if it's true that your criteria of necessity does not apply, since the dissolution, dissolution, and reestablishment of the EU is, as you say, fantastical. Is that the correct standard? If it's, if it's in no way practically feasible, whereas forms of uh, militant democracy might be feasible? That's, that's a great question, Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope we'll, we have the recording so we can check, but I hope my formulation was that it seems fantastical. Um, and let me, let me say maybe a little bit more about that. I think that while this kind of more convoluted legal possibility for real disassociation from a member state, while it seems fantastical, that if a member state were to cross some deeper red line and become a frankly autocratic state, that basically there would quite quickly be unification amongst pro-democratic actors, that they would need to be isolated in some way. And then the question is, how do you make that happen? Now, if we're in a situation like we are now, or like we seem to be now, that the mechanisms that we have in place for isolation, such as Article 7, are not even feasible because they would rely on unanimity in the council, uh, whereas you have more than one backsliding actor, then, then you need to start being creative, right? The, the, the reason I started thinking about this possibility is, is a throwaway comment made by Mark Rutte in the Dutch parliament um, a couple of years ago, where he, he referred to a conversation that he had been having with uh, European heads of state and government um, as to, you know, the possibility of creating uh, a new European Union. So, so, so with that in mind, of course, the conditions are not there now. And of course, most people who are pro-European in some, in some sense um, are, are very uncomfortable with the, with the idea that, of that being possible. My perspective is slightly different. I think that clarity about the fact that it's not only possible, but in certain circumstances that we wish to avoid would be both necessary and one of the kind of likely ways that this could happen, um, that itself might actually make a difference. Because I think one of the things that empowers populists and autocrats in Europe is the idea that they have full sovereignty over their membership. It's a perfect segue into um, Paul's question. Paul Taggart asks, um, again in the chat, so I'll read it and hopefully I get the question correctly. Can you reflect on a link to the res to responses to populist government? 
where do populists become, um, where populists, where do populists become the target of militant democ democratic instruments? And is it their populism or something else? Fantastic, thank you so much, Paul. Um, here we start with a, with a thorny question about which much has been printed, which is if populism is anti-democratic. My own, my own evaluation of this, of course, it depends on how you define populism, right? So some definitions of populism build in some anti-democratic characteristic into the definition, and then necessarily populism is always anti-democratic. And then also it's always, you know, if, if you were to respond in a militant democratic way to a populist actor, it would always be for their populism, which is at the same time their anti-democratic activity. My preferred definition of populism um, is not necessarily incorporating anti-democratic um, activity. I think in certain, but, but here, we're, here we're really broaching like a, a very deep debate as, as, as you know, right? So I think that in certain cases, when elites are corrupt, um, a populist response is uh, legitimate. A populist response where, where populist actors would say, we, the people, think you, the elite, are corrupt, and we should, you know, we should be voted into office to get rid of you. Uh, in certain cases, I think this is this is a plausibly legitimate and, and democratic move. Of course, then you would expect some kind of development, right? You can't maintain this this populist um, strategy or style uh, once you've gotten rid of a corrupt elite. Um, in that sense, I don't want to build in an anti-democratic nature into populist actors and, and activities necessarily. Um, so then the answer to your question on those lines would follow that populist governments become targets of militant democracy when they act in an anti-democratic fashion, or they become possible, justifiably uh, become targets when they act anti-democratically. And when they do, it's not their populism, but it's the fact that they're act acting anti-democratically. Okay, thanks. Um, what should we do, Annika? Um, I mean, um, should we move on to the next presentation or, um, oh, is there another one? Sorry, there's something. Um, is, uh, is Paul saying, thanks, oh. Tom, nice, clear oh, response. Thanks. Okay, it was your response. <laughs> and, it's, and it's exactly 1 p.m., I think, yeah. uh, which yeah. is a way you said you, you have to head off. So uh, thank you very much, Tom, you. For, your, yeah. for your thoughts and for your um, uh, for you for the discussion uh, round of applause uh, from everyone and um, I think we'll just hand over to to Gizem and and your presentation thanks Thank so much again. for having me and apologies again that I have to leave early yeah hello and uh, today I will present my paper called the challenging the European norms from inside so in this paper, I basically have two main questions. The first one is, why did the EU not respond until the last moment, even though there has been rule of law infractions since 2010? And my second question is that, why was the EU response biased? Why did the EU favor Hungary over Poland when punishing these countries for their infractions? And that these two puzzles are important because firstly, the EU Aki and other EU agreements refer to the rule of law as an inviolable value. But when some member states violate the rule of law, the EU institutions are either slow to answer or do not answer at all, indicating a serious governance problem. Secondly, when the EU institutions act, they do not behave impartially, which creates a differential treatment problem. For instance, Hungary has been viol violating the rule of law and many other norms since 2010, but the first country slammed with the European Commission rule of law framework and subsequent action was Poland, even though the liberal turn started in Poland in 2015. So my argument is basically twofold. I argue that the EU institutions were not able to respond to the initial challenges by Hungary and then by Poland. Because the EU institutions are fragmented and politicized, which slows down the decision making process. And secondly, Poland and Hungary use their strategic leadership capabilities to circumvent fragmented EU institutions. Similarly, 
the differential behavior of the EU towards Hungary and Poland can also be explained by the leadership capabilities of these countries' leaders. For instance, Hungarian politicians, especially the Prime Minister Viktor Orban, created alliances with different politicians in the European Parliament, European Commission, and the Council. Moreover, the Prime Minister of Hungary implemented some of the decisions of the Court of Justice of the EU, which made EU officials to appease Hungary. On the other hand, Polish officials did not show any deference to the EU and its institutions. They antagonized the EU. So when the time came for some sanctions, Poland was first to be punished. Basically, I'm contributing to two different literatures in my paper. The first one is the strategic leadership literature, and the second one is the material and social sanctions literature. And uh, in the materials and social sanctions literature, the idea is that uh, social sanctions, such as naming and shaming, are more effective compared to the material sanctions. But my research shows that, especially on the rule of law crisis, the naming and shaming approach was not useful. So obviously my explanation for what's going on the rule of law crisis is not the only explanation. There are competing explanations. The main competing explanation is that party politics is the main determinant in the rule of law crisis. Basically, this literature argues that membership to different party groups in the EU can explain the differential treatment and the delay in the EU's response to the rule of law challenges. As we know, Fidesz, Hungary's ruling party, belongs to the European People's Party, which is the largest party in the European Parliament. And the party politics literature argues that Hungary's membership to the EPP is the reason for delayed response or preferential treatment towards Hungary. On the other hand, Law and Justice Party belongs to a smaller party group, which does not have that much power in the European Parliament. I show that, like, even though these, like, belonging to different party groups uh, may explain the initial years of the rule of law conflict, it is not enough to explain the current developments. Because, uh, as we also know, Hungary was expelled from uh, Fidesz was expelled from the EPP, and also Fidesz didn't have that much of a good relationship with the EPP since 2017. On institutional fragmentation and politicization, I basically argue that there are three powerful EU institutions, and there is significant fragmentation between these institutions. And the fragmentation increases with increasing politicization in the EU. And when politicization increase, we see that national political concerns become more important at the international level. For instance, Holesh and Kriyazi argue that Poland and Hungary's coalition at the council level made it kind of impossible to punish these countries for the rule of law infraction. Secondly, under institutional fragmentation and politicization, I argue that there is a significant imbalance between the EU institutions. For instance, Schmidt argues that there are the new supranationalist group, which argues that the commission is more powerful, while the new intergovernmentalist group argue that council is more powerful. The main idea is that the EP, which is the only popularly elected body in the EU, has less power than both the EC and the council. And thirdly, as there are many different institutions, these institutions each have different voting mechanisms, and they also has a different available toolkit for dealing offending countries. And like, uh, there are four main tools available to the EU institutions. These are the Article 7 procedures, Rule of Law Framework, Rule of Law Dialogue, and the Official Infringement, infringement Procedures. And these procedures require at least two EU institutions working together, which is very hard due to fragmentation. On strategic leadership, I basically argue that Hungarian and Polish officials show their leadership capabilities in two ways. First, their ability to game the system and circumvent the EU institutions, and secondly, establishing coalitions in domestic and foreign policy areas. I argue that Viktor Orban is more skillful than Polish leaders, such as Jarosław Kaczynski, 
which explains the favorable treatment Hungary receives from the EU. So basically, we should think about what happened in Hungary and like how it started. Basically, Fidesz got elected in April 2010, and they started dismantling the justice system immediately after the ele election. Basically, in January 2011, Fidesz lowered, lowered the retirement age of all judges. And this law became problematic because they changed the retirement age of judges to different ages for male and female judges. And Venice, Venice Commission called Hungary to reinstate the judges and the EC started the infringement procedures. Obviously, these were not the only things that are happening in Hungary. The other issues were that Fidesz tried to decrease the power of the Supreme Court. Orban assigned his friends and psychophants to important positions, which decreased the freedom of media expression and other freedoms. And Orban increased the number of cardinal laws, which are the laws that require at least 66% approval in the parliament. And these changes made Hungary a competitive authoritarian regime. On this topic, Orban showed uh, his leadership competency by uh, using discursive tools and ambiguity. Basically, uh, Bachari calls Orban's approach as creative compliance because technically Orban's moves help him to be at minimum compliance with the European Commission while he can still violate the court's independence and the other general rule of law mechanisms. Secondly, Orban tries to legitimize the reforms that happens in Hungary by resorting to subsidiarity principle, which helps him to receive the seal of approval from international authorities. And thirdly, Orban basically became like this idol for the other illiberal governments, such as Romania, Slovenia, Czechia, and obviously Poland. So in Poland, the democratic backsliding started in 2015 with the election of Law and Justice Party. And basically, at the start of the rule of law crisis, uh, the Polish president, Andrzej Duda, refused to swear in the elected judges that are appointed by the previous civic platform government to the constitutional tribunal. And he rejected these judge judges Law and Justice Party elected their own judges and Duda swore in these judges immediately in a day. And then, even though the Constitutional Tribunal didn't want to accept these judges, he made it impossible for a Constitutional Tribunal to take any decisions because he stated the tribunal should have two-thirds majority to take any decisions at all. Uh, Karolinski and Benedict basically argues that Poland's unconciliatory behavior towards the EU made EU more belligerent. Moreover, the public opinion did not favor the EU in Poland. So when Polish officials act more antagonistic, their approval got higher in Poland. And I have several examples on like how like basically Poland was unconciliatory. For instance, when constitutional tribunal took a decision which was uh, conflicting with the law and justice party government, the president, Andrzej Duda, stated that the tribunal rulings are not binding. They are at an advisory capacity. And uh, we know that this is actually not true. Similarly, when the German commissioner dealing with the rule of law crisis criticized Poland, the Polish minister of justice, Zbigniew Ziobro, stated that Poland is punished unfairly and like there are the EU is applying double standards. Similarly, the Polish foreign minister criticized Franz Timmermans, who was again dealing with the rule of law crisis, and stated that Franz, Franz Timmermans is attacking Poland, a sovereign country, uh, politically, and it's trying to start a political debate about Poland in the EU. As these show, Polish officials were not appeasing the EU like Hungary, explaining the differential behavior towards these at the EU level. So. As conclusion, the evidence shows that the EU institutions are highly fragmented and Hungarian officials have better strategic leadership capabilities than Polish officials. And my research also confirms what Müller was arguing, that the tools to deal with the rule of law violations are not enough. And 
finally, Orban and Kaczynski's relationship shows that the EU definitely cannot deal with more than one non-violating country as illiberal leaders protect each other at higher levels of the EU policy, especially at the council level. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so we'll look to the audience. Um, um, if not, um, maybe I can give everybody uh, a little bit of time to think. I, I've yeah. got a question okay. uh, for you, Gizem. Thank you so much for this presentation. Now, now you have like in your argumentation, you have a lot of very strategic. Uh, elements to it and strategic behavior and that to a large degree makes a lot of sense to me but I wonder whether there's also a factor of simple simply time and sort of sequence at play um, since like with Orban we've seen this sort of slow move from a anti-communist liberal kind of seemingly democratic politician in the early 90s drifting over um, to kind of the bad side, right? To the dark side. Um, and he was basically, and his government, I mean, basically broke the mold, did something that nobody in the EU thought um, was actually like possible, that one of the European countries, one of the EU members could go um, anti democratic. And so I wonder whether there is sort of a, from that, you kind of got a path dependency of waiting, uh, not strong reactions, ho hoping to hedging, and you know the the the, um, the 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 strategy within the the EPP was very much let's keep um, Orban in the in the party uh, to to sort of to try and bring him back to the kind of to, to, the, uh, to the righteous path. Well, then once Poland started to make a similar turn, it's five years later, the EU has started to learn that that basically doesn't really work and maybe a more, uh, a stronger uh, reaction is warranted. So I wonder whether with Hungary, you have basically a path dependency of very slowly adapting while with Poland, a certain level, uh, um, a certain lesson was already learned, and I wonder whether that, to a certain degree, also uh, might explain the different reactions. That is actually a great question. I uh, didn't think that much about timing, but like when you explain it that way, I think it makes a lot of sense. Definitely, I agree with that. Like. Hungary was like taking its time with the demographic backsliding. Again, Orban had a political career and it took him like more than 10 years to bring Hungary where it is now. On the other hand, yeah, Poland tried to be like Hungary, but in a very shorter time. And obviously the EU learned in that time. But also like if the problem starts with that, if the EU started learning with Hungary, when they understood that the hunger will not come back. Why did they not start to like uh, take like better approaches towards Hungary? Like they could have like uh, more, more harsher punishments. They could have bring like uh, fines, etc. Like they are currently doing with Poland. So this is one of the reasons why I think that Hungary is kind of getting the preferential treatment. And like obviously, as the part of politics literature argues the EPP was definitely trying to protect Hungary for a really long time and they were really hoping that it will come back to the fold but since 2017 I think like Hungary's relationship with the EPP was actually not that great and after all EPP decided to expel Fidesz in 2021 and still it's been like a year and we still don't see that much of a change from like the EU's attitude towards Hungary. Hey, th thanks. Um, um, Luca also has a question um, from, and uh, I'll read it out. Uh, he says, thank you again. Um, 
So relating to Annika's observations regarding bringing back politicians to a more democratic agenda, what are your expectations about how the relationship between Poland and Hungary will develop as a consequence of Russia's invasion? To me, this seems like a chance for EU institutions to get closer to Poland again, while they might seem to have lost um, Hungary. That is a perfect question. And it's actually like, I've been thinking about it since the Ukrainian, like Russia's invasion of Ukraine started. Because as we have seen, Poland is taking great approaches to Ukrainian refugees. And also, I think uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki or the President Duda made like uh, some comments on like how Hungary's behavior is unacceptable because Hungary is actually like still continue to like support Russia by like trading with them, etc. And like by blocking like the more EU level sanctions. So I think there is genuinely like a chance for the EU to have better relationship with Poland and maybe bring Poland back. But I also feel like Hungary is completely lost. And like, given that Orban got elected at least one more term, I think the democratic backsliding will continue in Hungary, like in a faster way, because basically these election results show that like, Hungarian people are kind of happy with what is going on in Hungary. But I think that Poland has more chance to come back to the EU and like implement the reforms that is asked by the EU and become a more democratic country. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Maybe just to, to connect to, uh, to Tom's idea, um, do you think the EU should kick out Hungary <laughs> <laughs> to save the rest of the EU and the EU's democracy? I mean, as we all know, there is no kick out mechanism in the EU. And I don't think that Hungary should be kicked out because like kicking out Hungary means that like uh, the EU is also abandoning people like who didn't vote for the current government or like who's currently unhappy with what's going on in Hungary. And also I remember that like, I think I was looking at like the European value survey or something and like basically Budapest is the only city in the EU which declared that they have more attachment to the EU than like they have an attachment to Hungary or like compared to any other city in the EU, they are the only city that is connected to the EU more than they are connected to their like national government. So I think like it will be a big disservice to kick out Hungary. And I think that like, after all, as Hungary still has democratic elections, Orban still can lose an election. I'll read the elections are free, but not that much fair. And then I think there will be a reconciliation between Hungary and the EU. I mean, so it's interesting, huh? Because I mean, when you were talking, I was um, I was thinking what the, what Orban perhaps, and this I'm in dangerous territory. This is not really my area, but um, what what Orban has really cleverly done is um, sort of really played the um, the electoral agenda, right? I mean, so backsliding is primarily come through um, well, other ways as well, but primarily through um, um, adjusting the electoral laws, right? I mean, it, it seems like this is the main way to, to sort of, you know, move towards what I would say is a competitive authoritarian regime. But at the same time, I mean, Orban, as you said already, is is has really played the international um, environment really, really cleverly, right? So you say that he was, um, you know, only very recently kicked out of, of a very mainstream political faction in the European Parliament, right? And I was just thinking about an, another event that I, I wasn't aware of until a couple of weeks ago. And I was asked by the, the Dutch Dutch radio to comment on, on the fact that, and I didn't know this until they asked me to comment on it, I had to look it up, um, that, that CPAC just held their conference um, in Hungary. Right. I mean, so the, the, so these, you know, uh, right wing Republicans, but 
you know, not authority, not, not, ex but, but I don't know, it depends on your definition of extremism or not. <laughs> I mean, they're Republicans, right, in some sense with extremist elements, were there in, in Hungary um, with, with Orban as the keynote speaker, right? I mean, so I mean, in some ways he's been very clever. I mean, and this obviously just before his elections, right? And he positioned himself as the conservative, um, sort of, you know, as you said, as his alternative model, right? And so well so that, you know, the CPAC Republicans um, um, were, were willing to go to Hungary and hold their conference. So, I mean, I'm kind of just sort of a comment is it's just as you're talking, I'm just thinking how well Orban has really played the international scene in some ways to really have an alternative response to which in Poland seems more of a confrontational and in some sense, a legal confrontation, right? Um, where as opposed to here, in some sense, it's backsliding through electoral manipulation, which leads to other consequences. Anyway, just a quick comment. I see if it's worth commenting. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, I think in 2014, actually, Orban gave a speech on like how he wants to make Hungary an illiberal democracy. And he gave the example of Russia Turkey and China and how Hungary should like look at those countries. I'm from Turkey and I know that if Hungary is looking at Turkey as a role model, that is a problem. Okay, cool. Um, I don't see any other more comments, but we're pretty much right on time. Um, Annika, did you want to round things off for um, Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Gizem, for your uh, for your thoughts and your presentation and for the the answers uh, to our to our probing questions. And um, thank you for the uh, to the audience for stopping by and for your questions for for both our presenters. And I just want to briefly share with you what the next uh, sessions are about and I'm just going to put this and then switch over to this slide and here we go. No. Um, so our next session is in um, two weeks and we'll have Sofia Amasari and Luca Pestegen uh, both talking to us about um, party members of uh, populist radical right parties and how much they are ostracized and what it, how much they feel ostracized in their own parties depending on their uh, radicalism or in uh, society in general and then uh, two weeks later we have Lisa Zehnter and Brett, uh, Brett Meyer who will um, present their research on how populists react to challenges but for now I uh, I uh, want to thank you again for, uh, for being here, for joining us in the Populism Seminar and hope to see you all again in uh, two weeks time, same place, same time. Bye-bye.